right, are we at seven? Just about. Let's see. <laughs> um, okay, so the list went fast. True. Well, we will have these available as well. We'll find a way to get them either on our website or with the video. Um, we'll, we'll make sure, or I'll probably just end up sending an email to you. I tend to do that. I try to follow up with emails for everyone so that you have all the information. All right, well, we've reached time. So I'm gonna go ahead and start introducing some of the, the housekeeping things about our, our evening. So attendees, you're automatically unmuted when you're joined. So there won't be a, any chance for you to make any verbal questions. We've got the Zoom open right now, as you, or excuse me, the chat open right now, as you can see. We're gonna close this uh, while Leon is talking. And, but we will leave the Q&A open. So if you have any questions, just uh, please write in the Q&A to all panelists and attendees um, uh, to us, what questions you would like for Leon. And he's gonna speak for about 50 minutes. And then at the end, we're gonna read him as many questions as we can from you guys. And I always try to get that, those questions that we don't get to, to him or to whatever speaker we're having after, and, and if they can, they will follow up. A recording is also being made right now, and that will be sent to you after, um, after the webinar. It usually takes a few, a few days, so for us to, to get things a little organized. Okay, can we get to the next slide? Perfect. Um, so I wanna introduce, I'm gonna actually turn it over to Leon for, for him to introduce himself. He is from Lac de Flambeau. Uh, there is contact information that will also be shown at the end of the slide. So if you want to talk to him or have any specific question for him, uh, you're, you're more than welcome to do that. Okay, I think it's time to turn it over to Leon. Can we uh, do that, Kristen? Okay, perfect, thanks. All right, Leon. Take it away. Hey, can everyone hear me okay? Can you hear me? Am I coming across loud enough? Yes, yes, absolutely. Right, great. Okay, well, let me first uh, introduce myself. Um, thank you all for joining this evening. I'm happy to be here this evening to have this uh, great opportunity to uh, engage in a little bit of storytelling, uh, a little bit about my uh, background. Um, when I was a young person, uh, I traveled about quite a bit listening to uh, the old people speak. And so uh, my parents were uh, forever uh, taking us places and we had an opportunity to uh, sit with a lot of elders. And then as I went along um, in my own path, um, I come to know various things from uh, visiting and spending time with uh, elders um, uh, here in uh, Ojibwe territory in the US and also in Canada. And so uh, I'm very uh, pleased tonight to be able to be here tonight to um, talk a little bit of, uh, in the first story that I'll be telling, I just want to set it up a little bit um, to give uh, all of our listeners a little bit of an understanding. Um, in our endeavor to uh, recall and remember uh, the ancient people, and I'm, I guess I'm kind of like the ancient people, um, we have different writing systems. And Maznakazun um, is what we call a picture. And so, the uh, ancient people didn't use their ABCs. Instead, what they did was they used pictures. And these pictures served as memory aids uh, to assist them in um, remembering important things. And so uh, in my uh, younger years, uh, as I went about listening to people uh, tell stories, uh, following my listening sessions, what I would do is uh, I would uh, jot down some notes, such as you see here on your screen, to assist me in um, recalling uh, what it is that was uh, told to me. So our process is uh, we say nabnutage, and when I nabnutage, what I'm doing is I'm basically repeating what it is that was told to me. And so the first story that I'll be talking about here, I want to give you a little history here, uh, lesson real quick. Uh, as you know, um, the uh, period, uh, 
1854 uh, represented the um, the final treaty signed by Ojibwe Nation here, uh, in which um, four permanent reservations were established in Wisconsin. Uh, prior to that, uh, <clears throat> the uh, initiative was to remove um, Native people uh, west of the Mississippi River. And so when this uh, when these reservations were um, created, Lac de Flambeau, Bad River, uh, Le Coudre, and Redcliffe, um, there were um, uh, that established uh, what what it is that was surveyed and, and lands that were uh, set aside for uh, permanent homelands. Thus, the Ojibwe people would not be removed. Uh, and uh, unbeknownst to a lot of people, is that the uh, um, Ojibwe people um, were nomadic and uh, continued to uh, live the nomadic lifestyle uh, after the Treaty of 1854. And there were still a lot of people that were um, uh, living throughout the territory. Uh, Wisconsin uh, had not uh, become overpopulated that, at that point. And so there were still lots of people traveling about. So uh, this is the time period that this story is, uh, is kind of uh, embedded in. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and begin uh, telling that story at this time. And so uh, as you look at your screen there, uh, I'll be talking about what it is you see there to help you understand uh, a little bit about this story. So me, oh, oh, guys, you were back as you were here, that's a nishna big a moadama mitigua king, mikia dashaba bibund. There were these uh, native people, they were Ojibwe's, they, they were there in the forest. It was winter time. And uh, they're visiting inside of that lodge. And there was an old lady there. And there were other people there. So that lady was talking about how it is that they had planned to make a rabbit skin blanket. And this was the talk as they were inside of that lodge in the wintertime. And as they spoke of these things, uh, I can tell you that those that were there, they were very humble people. And I guess uh, from an outside point of view, if you were to view upon them, you would probably say, get the magasi wag. And when we use that expression, what it's saying is they were impoverished, they were poor. They almost had nothing. Everything that they had, they received from the earth, the forest, the lakes. They hunted, they gathered, and they survived. They're always happy, these Ojibwe Iwapi, living the life of their ancestors from one season to another. And so it was that uh, as these plants were being made, we are be Dagushinama, we are Bushki Wed, Gipi Dagushinama. A visitor came, he appeared there, Mishadune, he had a beard, Gnuzi, he was tall. And he arrived there and he had some sort of business of sort. Anyway, he started talking. And when he was talking, he was using this language, this Jaganashimuin. And he started telling the people there who he was and why he was there. And he told those people, you know, I talked to your, your great white father. He's way over there out east. He lives in a big white house. I talked to him and he sent me over here. And he told me to tell you people, you're going to have to get over there and get on that reservation. 
And if you stay here, then I'm going to have to charge you taxes. Taxes. It's going to have to be paid for. This land will be taxed. That's what the visitor told these Ojibwe Anishinaabeg. The Ojibwe didn't understand English too well. And so they were a little bit puzzled on what it is that man was talking about. I just kept hearing that word taxes. So finally, one of those men that was there, he, he must have worked for some people earlier that summer, helping them build a barn. And he remember hearing that word, and he so he knew what they were talking about. So he went and grabbed those uh, sagaigan son, those little tacks, and he handed them to that chumokman. And he, here, uh, that chumokman, he didn't like that. He took those tacks and threw them off. Oh, he was frustrated. Oh, geez, uh, these darn Indians, uh, they don't understand too well what it is I'm talking about. So uh, he told them, uh, I'll be back soon, he said. Uh, he was mad when he left, but he promised to return. And so uh, those Ojibwe and Ashnabe, they continued to uh, put wood in their fire and they continued to uh, make plans for... Uh, this nice rabbit robe that was going to be made. And they talked about their nagwagan. You see it hanging there. That's that snare they used to catch those wabuzu in the wintertime. Let's go to the next slide, please. And so uh, that was the plan. And, you know, uh, in Ojibwe territory, the best made plans often don't pan out the way we intend them. Because uh, as the people went off to check those rabbit snares, something happened. And one of those, he encountered someone out there. He could see these, oh, they were Mitcha Magadun, Nu Bimikue, and they were big tracks in the snow, and they were deep. Whatever had made those tracks was big and heavy. And as he went a little further along to check those snares, that's when he saw that one. Oh, he wab man dasha nu misabe one gab with the mahe oh and shabe nini. He saw that giant standing there, and he was very afraid to see this giant. Because our history with the giants isn't too good. And that giant, he reached down and grabbed a hold of that band. And he had a nice little snack. And off went the giant into the forest. These hunters, they went. They went searching for these snares, but just as their counterpart there, the same had transpired. The giant was hungry. He was very hungry. And that's what he did. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, back in that lodge, there was a grandmother and her daughter with the children. They were waiting. One of those, Abinujiag, asked his mother, Where's my dad? And one of the other Abinujiag there, Ikwe says, that little girl asked her grandmother, Where's my dad? And those ladies didn't know what to say. Oh, now they're afraid. 
Galvin dash ki pi je giwe si wag nishna ben in yag. The men weren't returning home. So Galvin dash o giga ken zin. They didn't know what was going on. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so there were some uh, some Niniwag there. They were men. And they they decided uh, they were going to look into this matter. So one had a bow. He had a lance. Bejig dash nishna benini o giayan bagamagan, no adash bejig o giayan bashkiskan. He had a musket. Ni we wug nini wug, kima ja wug. We nandi kikenda nawa nakamigakama and mitikuwa king. So they want to know what's happening in the forest, so off they went in search of uh, their relatives uh, to make sure all was good. Next slide, please. These, uh, these men were gone. Gay Winwa, Gay Gawin, Dashkiti, Ajay, Giwe, Si, Wug, they didn't return. And so, in the village of the Ojibwe people, there was an elder. He was an elder man. He was an Aki Wenzi. He was a real elder. And as he thought of something to do, he called upon his dreamers, those that he had dreamt of many years earlier, to, to get guidance on how to solve this dilemma. And he was instructed, bring these guilizants up from the village here to your lodge bring them in. And so he called upon the young people, these young boys of the village, these Gwiwi Zansak, Binige Guma, kiddo, come in, come in here, he said to them. So me iwa pigi binige wa gwiwi zansak ka winna ugi kenzi na wawa na kamiga gwini wi in the book. They came in there and they didn't know what to think. They didn't know what to expect. And there sat that Aki Wainzi. Oh, he was an old, old timer. He was so old. He was so old, his hair was all white. All white. And he looked at these Guivisansug and told these Guivisansug, you know, there is trouble that has befallen. And I need your help. One of you, Guivisansug, has a very special gift. And tonight, we're going to decide which of you is carrying that gift. And when it's determined who it is that's gifted, you will now have the responsibility of saving us. Oh, now those Guilis Ansak are really nervous. And the boys asked the elder, well, how will we know? The elder said, it's very simple. He had a pipe. And that Aki Wenzi, what he did was uh, he put a sema, he put tobacco, he put that tobacco inside of his pipe. And he asked each one of those boys one by one. Mapi Jean, come here. Undasan Ma Pesho, come here close. And the first boy came up as he got close to the pipe. Pipe was cold. He asked the second boy, Yay, get in the Undasan Ma Bijan Ma Pesho, come up here close, he said. Don't be afraid, the elder told the Guivizans. Oh, Gaget, so that Guivizans, he, he got brave and he walked right up there, close by. And Tabishko Eko, just like before, it's still cold. 
So the third boy, Eko Nissing, we was at Kipi Jadaba, me Minua Kedasha Gawin Ugikashkatu seen the Sagaswa, Yawaki Wainzi. He was still yet unable to smoke. But now that fourth boy came forward. And as the fourth boy came forward, somehow, some way, the pipe ignited. And now the elder, he smoked the pipe. And as he smoked the the tobacco lifted upward into the air, drifting out of the lodge with his thoughts and his prayers. Next slide, please. So he told that Guizans, he said, you're the one, you're the chosen one. <coughs> you're going to be, <coughs> excuse me, you're going to be the one that has to, uh, has to do these things. You're going to have to go look for that giant. He's out there in the forest. And uh, the Guivizants, he looked at the elder and he told him, Oh, Gawin, Ningusa, Sin, I don't fear that. Misa, wish. He was Zungade, as we say in our language. He was brave heart. He was courageous. And so, Koe, Ninga, Jegiwe, Debois, Gego, and Deja, Debois, Ingoji. He told the old man, before I go anywhere, he said, I need to return to my home. So that's what he did. When he entered into his home, his grandmother was there. His grandmother asked him, what are you doing? Oh, uh, oh, yay, his grandmother said. Uh, he told his grandmother, I'm going to go look for that giant. His grandmother didn't like to hear that. She said, oh, yay, which means good grief in English. And so, uh, he asked his grandmother, uh, oh, before I go, he said, uh, I want to ask you, uh, can you help me? He asked his grandmother. His grandmother said, anything, anything, my boy, what can I do to help you? Anything. He said, oh, before I go, he asked her, he said, uh, could you make me a little buckskin pouch before I leave here? He asked his grandmother. And his grandmother was a little bit confused. Geez, he, my grandson's going to look for a giant and he wants to take a, a little buckskin pouch with him. I wonder what he needs that for. And her grandson said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. One more thing, he said, we is not going to be able he said, make it look like a necklace, he said, because I want to wear it on my neck. Oh, oh, Kado, that's what his grandma said. She said, I understand. So, she was finished quickly. How she gave that boy her ushishe, her uh, his new buckskin pouch, and that's what he did. He put it right over his neck, the bishku nabikuaga, and it looked just like a necklace when he put that there. Next slide, please. So our friend here, our Guivizans, off he went in search of Masa Bewish, in search of the bad giant. Oh, it wasn't long, and there they were. Oh, Michamagadu and the new Bimikuwe when they came out the ma. There were big tracks there in the snow. 
and he wondered to himself, I wonder how far off that Masabe wish actually is. And there he did, he followed along that trail, followed along, followed along. And he started to go a little tired and a little anxious. But still yet, he was determined. Zungadee, he was brave. So just when he wasn't expecting it, something came out of the canopy. It was Gichininj, it was a big hand. It's a big hand. That big hand belonged to Misabewish, the giant. The big giant lowered his hand. And with a big voice, he looked at that Gwiwi's ass and said, Who are you? Gwiwi's ass, he, he was a little bit afraid now. He thought he wasn't afraid, but after he heard that, he was, he was afraid. The giant laughed. <laughs> I'm not going to eat you, he said. But as he said it, he was thinking to himself, oh, this little Gwiwi's ass is, uh, he's kind of skinny. I'm going to have to fatten him up a little bit if I'm going to eat this one, he said. Next slide, please. So that giant, he had a, he had a shirt pocket. He put that little Gwiwizans right in his front pocket. And that Gwiwizans asked that Sabe wish, where are we going? Oh, that Masabe, he was, he was happy that that Gwiwizans would dialogue with him. And what he told him was, Oh, uh, Mikia Dasha. He said, we're going to, you and I are heading over to my place, he said. We'll go to my place, where it is I reside. Oh, that Gwiwi's ass was thinking, that's nice. Nishishin, majada, let's go, the Gwiwi's ass told Saab Ewish. So off they went, they headed that way. Next slide, please. And there in the giant shirt pocket is where they arrived. That giant, he lived in a log cabin. They call that log cabin Mitigo uh, Waka Igan. Oh, there was a fire going in there. There was smoke coming out of the chimney. Oh, that Gwiwi Sans, he'd never seen such a big log cabin. It was huge. That Ishkwande, oh, Mit Cham, that door was big. It was real big. I guess it would have to be that way because, after all, it was the house of a giant. We was asked, asked that giant, why, why did we come over here? And the giant said, Oh, we was asked, uh, are you hungry? I'd like to feed you, the giant said. And Gwiwizan said, well, not really. I, I had a bite to eat before I left today. Not really. The giant said, oh, I think you're hungry. I think you should eat. And so, they went into the lodge, into the house of the giant. Next slide, please. Oh, when they got inside of there, that Gwiwi says he couldn't believe what he saw. Everything was big. Kachia Pubby wind, there was a big chair. Kachia Dup wind, a big table. Everything. It was huge. Anyway, they weren't alone. What was saying? We the game again. Oh, Misabe wish, uh, Kiayat. On the other side of the room, it was the giant's wife. 
And the giant called up to his wife, Niwil, my wife. Be do me, Jim, or ma, all goo is a ma buck a day win. That little boy that's here, I think he's hungry. Shama, feed him. So, oh, bake a koe, that old giant lady said, hold on a second. She said, I'll, I'll whip something up. Oh, gay, get uh, very quickly. Uh, oh, minumate, my God, it smelled good in there. She made soup. Oh, they had good food over there. They had venison and wild rice. They made nabub soup. She made fry bread too. Pretty soon that we was answering you. He started to get hungry. Oh, yeah. He said, I think I am hungry. He said, he told that. Sabe wish. Anyway, while that lady was cooking that guivizans, he started looking around here and there. All of a sudden, he looked over on the corner of the table. He couldn't believe what he saw. It was all stacked up there, stacked up high. They were coins. It was Ozawabic. They were big gold coins. Those coins were as bigger than that Gwewe Sans. You can see them on the table there. Big gold coins were on the table. Oh, Mama uh, Kaden Dagwak. It was pretty amazing. That's what that boy was thinking. He'd never seen such big junya, big money. It was all wabic. It was gold. Oh, it was shiny too. Just shiny. Every time the light would hit it just right, that gold would shine just nice on top of that table. Anyway, he asked that Masabe, he asked that giant, hey, uh, what, what are you doing with all that junior there, all that, uh, all that Uzawabek uh, there, Wagajaye Ma Dupuanin on top of the table here. And the giant told him, oh, that's my money. I, I won that gambling, he said. They didn't have no casinos then, but they had, uh, he had the uh, moxin game. That's when he won that, I guess. Must have been gambling against some other giant somewhere, and he won that. He brought that there. And that we would then said, oh, you like to gamble, huh? And that giant said, well, yeah. Do you like to gamble? He asked that we would sense. That we would then said, well, I haven't done too much of it, but yeah, I think I do. I like to gamble, he said. Oh, okay, well, a giant said, well, how about if we have a little contest? The giant wanted to fatten that guiwi's ants up so he could eat them, see? The giant says to him, I'll tell you what, he says, uh, let's have a contest. Let's have a contest to see who can eat the most food. We'll start with this naboob here, he said. I'll take a bite, and you take a bite, and we'll see who can eat the most naboob. And... The boy said, well, what's the wager? What, what are we going to bet? Oh, that's easy, the giant said. If you win this bet, he said, you can take that Ozawabic. You can take that gold. Oh, okay, that Guizan said, that sounds like a bet. The boy asked the giant, well, what happens if you win? The giant said, then I eat you, he told him, for dessert. Oh, yay, the tata, yeah, is thinking. Oh, no. But that Guiwizance, he seemed to think he knew what was best to do. So he told the giant, I take that bet. Let's get it on. <laughs> Masabe called for his wife, bring that naboob in here. She put down a big bowl there. You can see it on the table there. Kachunagan. Big bowl there. That we was that said, I, I have my own spoon. He said, I don't want to eat off your spoon for COVID, he told him. <laughs> so that giant, he had a spoon and that 
We always ask, he had his own aim at Kwan. You can see it there in his hand. So the giant put his spoon in that bowl and he, you know how they eat soup like that? It's hot. Oh, we ask in the boom. No pogame. It tastes good too. We was ants. He took a spoonful down as well. So there they went back and forth. Giant took a spoon. We was ants took a spoon. Over and over it went. That whole kettle of powered. It was empty. That giant was looking at that Guiwi's ants. He was fattening up there. See him? Start to fatten up there. The giant was thinking, how oh, is that little guy still eating? So he told his wife, cook some more. Back into the kitchen she goes. You could hear those kiku, those kettles in there. And away when you could hear those knives moving in there. Who John and Mizzi? With the quayum. his wife was busy in there. Soon, there she had it. She had more food. Brought it out, set it on the table. Oh, that giant, he liked it. It was hamikoyas, it was beaver. And on that, oh, his wife cooked that mikozo. She cooked that beaver tail. Oh, that giant, he loved beaver tail. He asked that Guivizans, hey, Guivizans, you like uh, Mikozo? Oh, gay, okay, get that Guivizans. Said, I eat beaver tail all day long, he told that giant. Oh, there they went again, bite for bite, bite for bite. Masabe could not believe it. Oh, man, he's looking at that Guivizans. He was getting fatter and fatter, chewing and oh, but he just kept on eating. Well, I'm going to tell you what happened. That Guivizans, he was using that Bashkweganu Mushkemud. All that food wasn't going in his Umisading. It wasn't going in his stomach. That food was going into that buckskin bag. You know how that Bashkwegan is when you get it wet? It stretches. And oh, there was some magic in that bag his grandmother put there because it didn't matter how much food went in that bag. It just kept stretching, stretching, getting bigger, bigger. Now that giant was thinking, yep, he's about fat enough now. I think I just about got him where I like him. I was thinking about that Guiwi's ants. That Guiwi's ants said, you have any more food? Back into the kitchen goes his wife. Cook, cook, cook. Geek, geek, cheap, awkward. You know what? Now she comes out with more food. That giant, he he couldn't he couldn't take it much more. He was so full. He had eaten all those beaver tails. He'd eaten all that soup. He'd eaten all that zasukokwa and all that fry bread. Oh man, what am I gonna do? He said, I can't lose to this guivizance. I can't let this guivizance take all my gold. So that Guivizance, he sure was, he sure was determined to win. And just like before, as the new food came out, once again, not in his mouth, but down into the bag. The giant couldn't take it anymore. Enough of this nonsense, he said. This is over, he told the boy. Oh, he was angry. Plus he had, he had a stomach ache. <laughs> That Guiwiz then said, well, I'm going to make you one more bet, Masabe. He said, one more bet. Masabe said, what's that bet? He said, I'll bet you can't do this. He said, and Guiwiz then reached in his pocket. And inside his pocket, he had a little mukumanes. He had a little knife in there. And he took that knife. And he took that knife and he cut himself right across his umisad, right across his belly. <laughs> cut it right open and as he cut it all that food that was inside that Pashkwegdo Mushkamu dancing come pouring out Masabe couldn't believe it you're not going to beat me he said he grabbed his Mokoman from his his belt loop and he cut himself and that was the end of Masabe oh Masabe didn't make it 
Oh, his wife seen that and she didn't like that. She told my Guivi's aunts, you better go home, young man. So just before Guivi's aunts left, he looked over at that gold and he kicked one of them coins off the table. And wouldn't you know it, that thing rolled right out the door and right down the hill towards where he was going. Oh, he got down that hill and he got over by that big gold coin and he started dragging it. Oh, it was hard to drag all that gold in the snow. But he dragged it and he dragged it and he dragged it. He got it back over to where his people were. He told his people, hey, look what I've got. Oh, they were so happy. They were no longer, get the magasi work. They were no longer poor. They said, uh, let's go over to Eagle River. They said, uh, we can buy salt and we'll buy some black powder for our muskets. And so they melted that gold down. And that Guiwizance was handing out chunks of gold to all those people in the village. They went to Eagle River. Oh, those people over in Eagle River, they couldn't believe it. Holy smokes. These Indians that showed up here today are rich, they said. They bought all the salt. And they bought all the black powder. And into the forest they went again. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, that, that man that was looking for taxes, he showed up back over there again. And when he showed up over there, all he could see was those wigwam frames. There was no one there. Geez, he wondered, how, how, how am I going to get taxes from these people? They're gone. And I guess they moved on. Those people, they never went back over there. They, they're nomads, those Ojibwe. They didn't want to pay no taxes to that guy. So, that's what happened when we was cheated the giant long, long ago, about the time they were trying to put everybody on the reservation around here. All right, so that ends that story. You can take that slide down and uh, we'll go to. Uh, how much time do I got left? Can I hear from the moderator? Yeah, you have a good 10 minutes left. Okay. Before we have to take questions. All right, I'll tell you another story then. So, Miga Ajuebuk, this is what happened one time. You know, in the world, there's these beings. Some are, they call Neokadejig. They're four-legged. And then these other, they call them Neokadejig. They're two-legged. So, those Neokadejig, those are the what we call oasia, those are wild animals. And uh, the Nijoka Dejig, those are what we call the Benesiwag and the Benesia, they're birds, they're birds. And so for the most part, uh, the four-leggeds and the two-leggeds got along here and there. But one time something happened, it must have been in the springtime, there was a there was a bird sitting on that nest. was this swaning Beneshi. That little bird was sitting on the nest. And uh, there were uh, there was but one egg there on that nest. Oh, that bird was so anxious, so happy. Oh uh, soon Waiba Banajaji we we Pijadama. Pretty soon there's gonna be a little nestling here that that bird was thinking. And that Benishi was very patient, just keeping that egg nice and warm. But, you know, it's hard work sitting on that egg all the time. And as that Benishi looked down on the ground, there it was going across the, the ground there. It was a moose. It was a worm. Oh, bakade, uh, Benishi. That bird said, oh, that worm looks so good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go down there real quick and have a little snack. So Miga Dasha Obaneshi. That bird hopped off the nest and picked up that moose. Oh Mino Pogose. That worm tasted so good. And then uh, the bird returned to the nest. Sits down, starts to kind of get situated on top of that egg. 
But there was something amiss. And that bird looked back, and looked around, and here that wawan that was there was gone. That egg was gone. Someone had stolen that egg. Oh, Baneshi didn't like that. Looked around and was trying to frantically find where that egg went. And as that Baneshi looked around there, she could see off in the distance there was someone running with that uh, with that wawan. That animal is called uh, Jangweshi, a mink. That mink was running with that egg. And as that Jangweshi was running with that wawan, he was he was drinking out of that Bishku Minikwaj gun, just like a drinking vessel. He was drinking that egg. And oh, that Benishi was so mad. Anyway, that Benishi never got over it. And Benishi went around the world telling all the other birds, oh, Maji Jueb Zawad Neil Kadejik. She was saying, Oh, those animals, they're so bad. They're terrible. She just ran them down bad. So somebody must have been listening to her because there must have been a beach there. Jigabig, Bejig Dash Makwa. There was one black bear there, Makade was in Makwa. He was by the lake shore. He was fishing there. He caught a bunch of fish. And after he ate his fish, he decided he was going to take a little nap. So that mukwa stretched out on the sand. Felt so good in the sun. I think I'll take a little nap right here, he thought. So as he was lying there, something happened. He could hear that sound. Sound of wings. It's a bird flying overhead. Oh, that's just a bird flying, he thought. He continued to take his nap and enjoy the warmth of the sun. And that's when it happened. Right between the eyes, something came out of the sky. It was wet. Kind of smelling it. Oh, that, that didn't smell too good. And he kind of smeared it off his head with his paw and he looked at it. Wabishka, Maguk, it was white. Well, oh, that Makwa, he didn't like that. What, what's wrong with those Benishi He said, the why, who, who does that? He said, he goes over and he starts telling all those other Oasi about that, about how bad, the, oh, Majish, Webzo, Benishi He was telling them, they're awful. He said, you know what they did to me? Pretty soon, everybody's all worked up. We, me, God, they, they, well, they're going to have a fight now. So both teams met. Yeah, we're going to get those two-leggeds. The two-legged said, yep, yeah, we're going to get those four-leggeds. So there they were. They decided it's going to be on tomorrow. There's going to be a fight tomorrow. So the two teams met on opposite ends of the field. And the Oasia, they said, you know, we got we to gotta have a plan here. And the Benishia said, yeah, we got to have a plan here because uh, we got to win this. So as the animals looked around, they kind of assessed who was on the team. There was Kichimakwa, there was a grizzly, there was Mushko de Bejiki, a buffalo, there was Esiban, the raccoon. Oh, they had a real all-star team. And lots. Gitaga Biju, Bobcat. Yeah. And over there on the other side there, those Benicia, they had they had some good players too. Dean DC, the Blue Jay, Upichi, the Robin. They had Nanush Gashi, a hummingbird, a G-Jock, the crane. He said, uh, I got real skinny legs. My knee's kind of bad, but I'll, I'll, I'll fight, he said. And uh, Anyway, they were, they were making plans. And pretty soon, uh, one of those birds kind of came to their senses there, that little bird they call that bird, Kichkichkinasi. Some people call him Gijiganasi. That's what they call a chickadee. That little black cat chickadee, he had, he had a lot of sense. He was looking down on the end, other end of the field and he could see that big buffalo and that grizzly bear. And there was a Wawash Geishi, Ayabe, there was a buck down there. He could see all those big, big animals down there. And he looked at those Beneshiag and said, 
what's wrong with you guys? I mean, uh, is your way busy egg? What, what's the matter with you guys? Are you crazy? He said, did you see that team down there? They kind of start thinking about a little bit and they said, well, I, we're going to have to change our strategy here. So let's send a spy. They said, let's send a spy. So they looked around who, who could spy. There was that little Nanush Gashi, that hummingbird. Well, let's send him. He's the smallest one. They, they won't see him. So he started flying that way. And you know, think about that Nanush Gashi. But he flies, he makes a lot of noise. Oh, like that. You know? Oh, no, they said, come back here. Come back here. Who can we send down there? Someone that's real sneaky. They looked through their ranks. And there he was. It was Amu, the bee. Hey, Amu, you think you could go down there and give a listen and what they're thinking down there? Yeah, I guess so, he said. You know that Amu, he doesn't fly the fastest. But he made it down there. He landed on a dandelion. He blended right in. Oh, those Oasia didn't even know he was there. Wait, wait, he was in the wall on. He was listening to them, what it was their plan was. So the leader there, he... He said, we're going to have Wagwash, the fox. He's going to be our leader. And his tail is going to be the flag. So I want everybody here to watch that flag. When that tail is up, that means charge. Go right straight ahead and you get those birds. But for whatever reason, if that tail goes down, that means turn around and run for home. That means things aren't going good. It was a waste of girl looking at him and Oh, well, I guess if that's the plan, they said that Buffalo said, I don't know, I have to be afraid of those little birds, he said, but I guess that's the plan. That's what Mashko De Bajiki said. So anyway, they're all nodding their heads. Hey, yeah, ha, ha, gay, get this will come, I understand. So that was the plan. So the next day, the sun came up. Both teams were assembled. They were ready to start their great battle between the four leggeds and the two leggeds. Wagwish the fox led the charge with his tail straight up in the air. Oh, he was so happy to be leading the charge. Kind of proud like that, that Wagwish. He come charging out there with his tail straight up in the air. But as he charged, what he didn't realize was there was that Amu again. He was already halfway down the field when it all started. He jumped right off that flower. And with his little stinger, he sunk it so deep into that Wagwish's tail. Oh, that hurt. We again, them. Oh, he was in so much pain. That tail went right down. All the animals, they couldn't believe it. They didn't even, the fight didn't even start, and that tail went down. So they turned and they all ran for home. And that's where it ended, right there. That's how it was that that Amusi saved all of the, all of the two-leggeds that day when the two-leggeds were going to make war on the four-leggeds. So uh, that's why they're still around today. And, uh, they, they still had their differences, but uh, they, uh, they decided that there's going to be a little treaty now. So they try to get along as much as they can nowadays. Okay, one more quick story I think I have time for, right? Yep, you sure do. All right, this next story I'm gonna tell you, it's, no, no, don't laugh, but the story is about who they call Bejigeshkani. Bejigeshkani means the one with one horn, and it's a true story. So, uh, Abding uh, went upon a time and there was a Nishnabe Nini Awe. He was a Ojibwe man and uh, he was a driver. And what he'd do is he'd drive elders around. These elders would say, Hey, uh, I need to go over here. Uh, you think you could give me a lift? Oh, sure, you betcha. He, he enjoyed taking these elders around. And as he drove the elders around, what would happen is those elders would tell him stories and he'd ask, things and he, he got a lot of information from the elders and in his travels he got to go lots of places and hear lots of things it was uh, such an enjoyable thing for my friend and so uh 
one time uh, they were up north of here and uh, that elder, he liked to, he said a swa, he liked to smoke cigarettes. So he told the driver, hey, uh, stop here. He said, I gotta, I gotta go inside here. He said, and, uh, same old Paul Gosson, that's what he wanted to get, that old man. So keep in the game out, that way we could be going. He went in that store. Anyway, while he was in the store, that driver, he decided, well, geez, I've been driving a while. He said, I better, uh, I think I'm going to take a little walk here, he said. And so uh, he looked across the road and it looked so nice. It was a nice day. It was winter time, and uh, but the sun was shining. Minugis, you got it was a nice day. So before he crossed the road, he he looked both ways. He was pretty safe that way. He didn't want to get run over by a car. And, uh, coast was clear, so he crossed the road. Ah, uh, say ma mikanang, wasayaing mikanang. He's on the other side of the road. Mikia He's standing on the side of the road, kind of wondering, well, what should I do now? Anyway, he looks down and there's. There's a little, uh, almost like a little valley. So he uh, he needs on the way. He went down that hill, and as he was going down, oh, Jushkwa Magakid was slippery. He almost slipped, but he was able to maintain his balance. And he was trying to figure out why am I going down here? But that's what he did. He went down that hill. He needs on the way. He went down that hill, and when he got there, there was a river, Zibi. It was a river. And you know how it is with rivers in the wintertime? That water is always moving. So that ice was pretty unstable. So he thought, well, I'm just going to enjoy the view. And he started looking. You know how Nishnabe are. They like to look around. And think about that Nishnabe. Whenever he gets somewhere, he, he looks at things in great detail. He was looking at the tree buds to see how far it would be till spring. He was looking at this and that. Oh, there's some medicine there, he said. And then uh, he started to look at the ice. He started to evaluate. Oh, uh, I wonder how that ice is. And as he was looking at that Nikwam, that ice, that's when he noticed it. There were tracks on that ice. Oh, what, what kind of tracks are those, he thought. Something had made those tracks. He, he moved a little closer so he could get a better look. And he thought to himself, well, I don't want to fall in the river here, so I don't want to get too close. But he got close there and he started looking at those tracks. And uh, those tracks were U-shaped. Like a U. Right before V, U. U like that. And... Uh, Oh, they were one after another like that. And he was looking at those tracks and he was thinking to himself, well, what in the world is that horse doing on the ice? He said to himself, why would that horse be walking on this river ice? And his uh, curiosity kind of got the best of him because next thing he knows, he's walking along the riverbank, following those, what he thought were horse tracks. They look like the letter U going on the ice. And um, he followed them a ways, and pretty soon those tracks stopped. They stopped right there. And my friend began to rationalize, well, what happened here? That horse didn't go to shore. Maybe he jumped in the river and started swimming. So he looked on the other side there to see if there were maybe tracks coming out of the water onto the ice on the other side there, that open water. No, nope, no tracks. He went up and down, looked, looked and looked. No, nope, order, nothing there, no tracks. So he went back to where those tracks ended. Oh, he was so curious. So I gotta know, he said, so. That's what they say. He, he walked out onto that ice. Oh, yes, he was walking. He was thinking, oh, uh, it's pretty dangerous. Be careful, he's thinking, as he walked on that ice. He walked over and he looked at those tracks, where those tracks ended. And where those tracks were, 
on that ice. It was maybe out, maybe six and a half, seven feet on each side of those tracks. There were marks in the snow. When he was looking at those marks in the snow, and those uh, those marks were the Bishku Megizi, like an eagle had been there. He looked really close. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Those were those were feather marks, and uh, he got a chill right up his back. And he ran off the ice and he climbed away. He climbed up the hill. He jumped in that car. Daban, that old man sitting in there. He saw the swat, that old man. He asked that old man, he said, Hey, he said, uh, oh, he said, uh, I, I was just down the hill there and I seen those uh, those tracks down there. And, you know, uh, do you know anything about that? And that old man looked at him and said, Yeah, that, that, uh, that Beige Geishka, he's flying around here all the time. He said, That's no big deal. He said, And that guy said, well, what do you mean, Beige Geishkani? He goes, yeah, he said that. He said, it's a horse that flies around here. He said, he's got one big horn. He said, that comes right out of his forehead. He said, he likes to fly around here. He said, and uh, uh, when people see him, it makes people feel good. So when uh, when that happens, he said, that's that's what happens. People feel good. And so that's what happened. And that's a true story. So I'll stop right there. I think my storytelling time is over. Thanks, Leon. That was really good. We've got a couple of questions. We've right, we're right up to the minute here, but a few people had some questions about in your daily life, how much of your interaction with other Ojibwe can you conduct in Ojibwe language? Um, probably, um, that's, uh, I guess, uh, up to me. That's up to me. <laughs> but unfortunately, I have to work. Um, I have to work a job. And so I have to use a lot of English in the course of the day. But if it was up to me and someone would pay all my bills, then I'd just go around talking to Ojibwe. But so, sorry. So far. I, not nothing at this yet. No. Uh, someone had a question about the giant story. Uh, he said, are tales of cannibal giants common in Ojibwe storytelling? Um, yeah, they are. <laughs> very, very I guess common. it was just a yes or no question. <laughs> um, and then there was a kind of a question about, are mystical gifts usually something only one person can have a time or can more people have them? Not sure what that means. but Well, I think what it has to do with is, uh, and I follow the question, um, there are, uh, um, in culture uh, and across world culture, not just Ojibwe culture, um, but within the human tribe, um, the, uh, there were gifts bestowed upon all members of the human tribe. And, uh, it went, uh, oh, a good example would be the Salem witchcraft trials. And there were some people that decided those people of the earth were evil and let, let, let's burn them. Okay, but actually, they were just people of the earth that had that had gifts for helping others, and so uh, there's plenty of examples around the world of um, of um, the human tribe having um, uh, gifts and abilities. Okay, someone has a question here. Their kiddo would like to know about the feather by the window behind you. Oh, that's probably um, that's Migasi Miguan. That's an eagle feather. And amongst the Ojibwe people, what happens is um, along the way, what happens is uh, we earn those feathers. We don't just possess them. We earn the rights to them. And so that particular feather there uh, is uh, one of the feathers that I've earned the right to. And so uh, I, have, uh, I have the rights to that feather, but also what that represents is responsibility. And so I have the responsibility for that feather. So in our culture, feathers are alive, they're living beings. And so uh, this feather is here uh, in my home and uh, I'm happy this feather is here with us. Okay. Um, another one, is there a protocol to becoming a storyteller? I think, um, you know, some people, um, some people just have a natural gift to, to tell stories. 
I think anybody has that um, um, ability to, to tell a story. Um, and, and I think it's important for people to tell stories, all people. And so I work with a lot of young people and I'm continually encouraging young people to, to verbalize and to, uh, to tell uh, because uh, our ability to communicate and, and relate and be clearly understood by others is a, is a necessary skill in today's world. And so uh, it's good. I want everyone to tell stories. <laughs> we have one question about the younger generation. So um, are younger generations picking up the language? Is there enough interest for the language to grow again? Yes, yes. Um, you know, you have to realize that um, the, the magnitude and the effect of cultural genocide, and um, this is a, a whole other conversation, but ultimately, um, uh, you know, people want, want, it's not like turning on a light switch. And so uh, across this great Turtle Island, there have been millions of dollars and millions of hours invested in uh, revitalizing native languages. And uh, some communities have had uh, more success than others. Um, but what I can tell you is that um, our movement to uh, revitalize Ojibwe in our territory is an ongoing process. And so um, we're very excited about the future. Nice. Well, we've uh, definitely run out of time a little bit. We, Sorry we kept you a little late, Leon, but we really no, appreciate no you, you giving all this time to us. We're a few minutes over. Um, I will get you a copy of everything that's come through, but if anyone has any questions, you can contact him directly at his Yahoo account. And um, so miigwech, Leon, for tonight, um, for what you do in the schools and with uh, keeping our language uh, going and revitalizing it in our communities. It's, um, it's a labor of love, and I really appreciate that. And you can tell them the way you talk. So miigwech. Um, and for everyone else out there, uh, if you'd like to, we would love to hear your feedback on tonight's program and any ideas you have for future programming, or if you'd like to have another Ojibwe storytelling program next winter, um, please let us know. You can go to our feedback. And his, uh, Leanne's specific event ID number is 8491. So that's what you will have to type in when it says event ID number. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. Uh, we're all over with the social media. We've got a whole wonderful uh, team for that. And so Sarah will be checking all of those. So if you have any questions, also just a reminder that we have recorded this and all of the recordings will be on our YouTube channel. So uh, we have the other three and in a few days we'll have Leon's up as well. And I got a feeling, Leon, that you're gonna. This video is gonna be shown in quite a few Ojibwe classrooms around uh, well, so. around the state. <laughs> so that would be nice. So we want to thank all of you for tuning in on this four-week series. Uh, Michael, Leon, Greg, and Edith. Uh, so grateful to you for sharing your stories, your hearts, your knowledge with not only Wisconsin, not only America but North America, Europe, South America, uh, we're just, we've just reached all of Japan, <laughs> can't forget Japan, um, all over the world. And it's been a beautiful thing. So we're gonna sign off now and uh, hopefully we will see you in next winter. And also keep tuning in because we'll have more programming throughout the year. So I appreciate you guys so much. All right, good night. Bye, Leon.